Good evening. My name is uh, Christine Lutranger. I'm the executive director of the Graduate Institute's Albert Hirschman Center on Democracy, and I'm pleased to uh, welcome you to this panel discussion on promoting human rights, tolerance, and non-discrimination, role of education. The event is organized in partnership with UNESCO and the USC Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, in cooperation with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief, and the World Jewish Congress. It is held within the framework of a two-day international workshop for policymakers on the role of education in addressing anti-Semitism. At the Albert Hirschman Center on Democracy, we are very pleased to co-host this public event with you. The topic is very important uh, as it relates to themes that we explore in our research. And we feel that our participation is very relevant given the center's reference to and inspiration from Albert Hirschman. Albert Hirschman was born in Berlin in 1915, a terrible time and the wrong place to be Jewish and progressive. When he was 19 years old, persecution, intolerance, and war decimated the cosmopolitan world that many of his generation had fought to defend. Hirschman left Germany for France, worked on the ground with an assumed identity and a fake passport. He did brave and very dangerous actions as a rescuer of the threatened Jewish population in Nazi-dominated Europe. He smuggled people out of occupied France and helped the evacuation of targeted victims to America. He fought in Spain and ended up in the US as one of the most distinguished experts on Latin America and on the problems of economic development. And surprisingly for someone who constantly mediated the nuances between living and fighting, one of his most famous and influential books is entitled Exit, Voice, and Loyalty. Hirschman was preoccupied by two fundamental questions. Why do people engage or disengage in public welfare? And how do people bring about social or political change? Hirschman best represents the type of research the center would like to host, as he aimed to open up the space for interdisciplinary and comparative research that crosses the borders not only between disciplines, but also that bridges theoretical and empirical research, academic and policy work. At our center, we explore the plurality of experiences with democracy in a global and comparative perspective. Hence, the question of norms and values assumes a great significance, as well as the role of education in promoting tolerance, human rights, and democratic ideas, as this panel will debate today. A warm welcome to the speakers, to the participants in the workshop, and to the audience. My colleague Davide Rodogno, professor of international history at the Graduate Institute and member of the Albert Hirschman Center on Democracy, will moderate the discussion. He has a long experience of researching and publishing on topics that are highly relevant to today's discussion, including the sensitive topic of anti-Semitism in Italy. And over the years, Davide collaborated with the Primo Levi Center in New York City precisely to reiterate and reaffirm the tragic consequences of Italian anti-Semitism. Relatedly, David is also organizing a workshop in collaboration with our center next February on sovereignty, nationalism, and homogeneity in Europe between the two world wars. With no further ado, I'm giving him the floor, and he will introduce the panelists. Thank you again, and a very warm welcome to you all. Thank you, Christine. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, I'm delighted and honored to be here tonight talking about this very, very important topic. I will not spend too much time introducing our guests tonight. I just would like to say a few words about uh, how we're going to proceed so that this is, every, uh, this is clear for everybody. We're going to give the floor to each of our panelists, distinguished panelists, for 10, 12 minutes. And then I will wrap up and immediately open up the floor so that we have as much time as possible to ask questions, to comment, and to uh, engage with this important topic. The order of appearance, so to say, is what you see there. So we'll start, we'll start with uh, Kate Gilmore, 
we continue with Ahmed Shahid, and we will finish with Dr. Herbert Winter. And I will let each of them uh, spend the time that they wish introducing themselves and spend the time that they wish their allotted 10 minutes talking about what matters to them. Thank you very much. Okay, the floor is yours. Just to introduce myself, I am not the High Commissioner for Human Rights. She sends her warmest greetings and appreciation to UNESCO, OSCE, the wonderful Special Rapporteur, to the uh, World Jewish Council, the Graduate Institute, and we're delighted to stand with you uh, to address this important matter. She apologises that... Well, she's not sorry that I'm not the High Commissioner. She just apologises that you're listening to me. <laughs> but on her behalf, thank you so much for making time for this important exchange. I mean, <clears throat> really, it's not as if the standards, norms and laws are not clear, thanks to such as the work and advocacy of Jamaica, Ghana, Côte d'Ivoire, immediately after the proclamation by affirmation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we have decades of normative, legal standards and details applied the world over. It's not as if we weren't told. How can it be that still millions are paying the cruel cost and casualty of race-based discrimination, of that maximum of hatred for minimum of reason? which is anti-Semitism, xenophobia, Islamophobia, intricate, toxic confinements of human opportunity, capability and contribution, narrowing, distorting, scarring human potential, offering a pretender's justification for unjust distribution of power, possibility and influence, seeding not prosperity but grievance, conflict, violence, the slavery-based economy, the cruel dehumanizing colonizer, the anti-Semitic po pogrom, the unchecked genocide, the racist migration policies, the women excluding parliaments, the sexually abusing Hollywood mogul, the disproportionate hateful response to young people protesting on our streets when the actions of the, of the powerful few tramples down the dignity of the many. We have lived in shame under history's clear analysis. In that, there is no north or south, there's no left or right, There's no east or west. There's only the humane and the inhumane. You know, the very foundations of the principles, values and ideals of the modern human rights system were laid down in the aftermath of the most inhumane, <laughs> drafted under the shameful shadow of the cruel and caustic moral pollution of Treblinka and Auschwitz, at a time when the body count of those lost to hate was far from complete, as humanity stared into the darkest abyss dug at its deepest by human cruelty, it was then, at the worst of times, having paid the horror price of political complacency and casual accommodation of hateful self-interest, it was then, in shame and in sorrow, that the founders of the United Nations pledged first and foremost not as countries not as nations, not to sovereignty or national prosperity or my country first or patrol borders, but as we the peoples. We the peoples, born free and equal in dignity and rights. And that resulting universal declaration of human rights anticipates our differences. It does anticipate that we might not share the same faith it seeks to protect, however, the believer, not the belief. And it seeks to do so in such a manner that 
your freedom of speech and worship can be integrated with my freedoms too from want and fear, indivisible one from the other. No fundamental freedom can be allowed its exercise in ways that obliterate realisation of the other's freedoms. My freedom from want and freedom from fear cannot be secured in the absence of your freedom of worship and freedom of speech. And the corollary is just as true. No freedom of worship or belief excuses disproportionate, disproportionate restriction on speech, nor can it be allowed to leave to foster cruel spread of want and fear, whether by acts large in scale or intimate in detail. Friends, we're not born to hate. No prejudice floats in our blood from birth. No instinct for contempt of a particular skin colour, a race, a religion, an ethnicity, a gender, a sexuality lurks ready-made, prêt à in our cerebral cortex. All of it is learned. It thus can all and must be all unlearned. And in that, there is enormous untapped potential in human rights education and consciousness raising with a combination of self-discovery, strong logic, clear facts, age-old truths, we all can emerge into a consciousness of our own and of others' inherent rights so that we may and they may claim them more effectively, defend them more comprehensively, make freer, more informed choices, develop the aptitudes and attitudes, the appetite to resolve conflicts non-violently, to contribute proactively to community formation, renewal. Human rights education supports critical analytical thinking where passivity may otherwise reside. And it invites us to solutions rooted in tolerance, upheld in law and viable for one and for all. It's not about a curriculum's content alone. It's about shaping a discourse for all of us, between us and about us, our most intimate selves. Who am I in relation to you? On what basis shall I decide my daily actions as they express me and impact on you? For human rights, education is not merely informing me of my rights, it is underscoring and emphasising your rights. It's been eight years since the General Assembly adopted the UN Declaration on Human Rights Education and Training, but we need greater progress, better quality, more delivery, delivery contextualised to the realities of what we're facing today. And today, that investment makes even more sense given we are gifted with the world's largest ever population of children and young people larger than ever before in human history. They are the sustainable development generation and it is their trajectory on which human progress, arguably human survival, will rise or fall. We have to refocus our education, not merely for them to learn about rights, but to learn how to live in rights. To be doctors who provide access to dignified care regardless of a patient's citizenship status or identity. To be lawyers who cherish equality before the courts and judicial independence. Journalists who love truth, protect fact and diversify voice. Scientists who pursue knowledge without fear or favour but deploy its fruits for the betterment of a planet under strain, a climate undergoing horrendous change, a people undergoing inconceivable suffering. To be innovators and creators, to replace more rapidly unfairness and exclusion with something more equal. To be dissidents who speak truth to power, not for their own elevation, but for the elevation of dignity of all. We have to teach artists who will disturb, provoke, illuminate, enchant, 
philosophers who will seek to understand and help us erode ancient instinct and practice of cruelty against each other. Workers for rights more than consumers of entitlement. In other words, we need an education for a common humanity. Friends, you know the, the American activist artist Billie Holiday sang out with a poet's voice against the horror that is racism. Southern trees bear strange fruit, blood on the leaves, blood at the root, black bodies swinging in the southern breeze. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. Well, in a world that flourishes so readily, spite and hate and bigotry in the name of your skin, of my identity against their faith, strange fruit is budding once again on populous trees. Destruction of the head, headstones of Jewish cemeteries, slaughter of people at worship, imprisonment of minority journalists, arbitrary detention of political dissidents, assassination of indigenous environmentalists, rejection at our borders of the refugee and fight, bullying of our children for their identity, indiscriminate rounding up of people simply for who they are. Are we to let these things pass unremarked, unchallenged again? Martin Luther King said, I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless midnight of racism and war that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become a reality. But King didn't have a nightmare, although he lived one, he had a dream. A dream that one day his four little children will be judged not by the colour of their skin, but the content of the character. It's clear. We can live indefinitely on this earth, but not as we have. It's way past time, but not too late, to invest now in the active fostering of a stronger, more robust, action-oriented empathy and respect within and across race, religious, religion, ethnicity, age, gender and sexuality. For that to happen, we must lower the fist and extend the hand. But to lower the fist, we must recognise first and foremost that there are those who have had it raised. And to extend the hand of community, we have to admit first that once it was withheld, to stand shoulder to shoulder with those who bear the greater sorrow of cruelty's manufacture, we must first recognise that we have allowed ourselves to stand apart. We've kept our distance and we've got to acknowledge that. For, as in physics, it is in the spaces between us, the quantum of those spaces, that matter is made up that constructs what matters. For to stand up more fully for our own rights, we've got to stand up for theirs. Yep, the devil is in the detail. But the devil also flourishes when short-term self-interests dominate our thinking and when our fears and anxieties keep us small and mean and short-sighted. The Talmud puts it this way, we must not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief, its fears, its challenges. <laughs> we must do justly now. We must love mercy now. We must walk more humbly now. We're not obligated to complete this work, but neither are we free to abandon it. Thank you very much, Kate. Ahmed, the floor is yours. Good evening. How does one follow that? <laughs> um, I'm it's a real honor to be here this evening. I want to begin by thanking the conveners for inviting me to be in this important panel. 
My name is Ahmed Shaheed. I'm the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief. I'm really pleased to be here because my UN work is tied to a declaration called the 1981 UN Declaration on the Elimination of All Forms of Intolerance and of Discrimination Based on Religion or Belief. 60 years ago, December, the small town in Germany, a bigot walks in and draws up a bunch of swastikas on Jewish properties. This is replicated in towns nearby, in countries nearby. Within a matter of days, this is before things go viral. It's all over the world. That's when the UN decided that it must focus on intolerance based on religion and race. Of course, unfortunately, it took the UN almost 30 years, from 1960 to 1981, so 21 years, to get to a declaration. But that declaration makes the essential point that we all have a duty to ensure that we raise our children to live in societies that, that, are, that are pluralistic, to respect difference, to respect people's faith, and religion, and be able to live as responsible adults in a multi-ethnic society. The role of religion, I beg pardon, role of education in dealing with intolerance, therefore, is, 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 quite, is quite, quite clear. As Epid Hakepishina said, we are not born hating people. We were all born babies, not bigots. But some of us, I think, grew up to become bigots, and therefore, it is important that we learn how people turn across the path and become stray into hatred and bigotry. And to re and recognize that education has a vital role to play in combating intolerance. This can be done through promoting human rights, promoting respect for diversity, and insisting on the value of an importance of non-discrimination. All educators know the importance of education for transmitting values. Of course, there are those who abuse that, that privilege, that knowledge, but we have to use education as a way to open up people's minds, young people's minds, as a context in which young people can learn about other people, other places, people, of di people with different races and religions and cultural affiliations, and to learn about different in both time and space, and also learning about oneself. To hold a mirror to themselves, to unlearn their prejudices, to dissolve their stereotypes, and also increase their own agency, and recognize the importance of respecting and supporting others' agency as well. Just heard about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and this is well recognized in that declaration, which after, at the start, proclaiming the importance of respect for each other as a foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world, says, calls upon every individual and every organ of society to promote these rights through teaching and education. There's a fundamental role that, that is there uh, for that. Of course, as a UN reporter, I will rattle out a number of UN, UN standards on this. As I mentioned to you, 1981 declaration, while of course recognizing the right of parents to raise children in accordance with their religious beliefs and conv moral convictions, nonetheless insists that they be raised in an, in an environment which makes them uh, conducive to, uh, to enable them to live a life that will uh, in, in a multi-ethnic and multi-religious society. Moreover, Article 26 of the same document, of the declaration, says that education should promote understanding, tolerance, and friendship among all nations, races, and religious groups. So there is a clear obligation from the word go on educators to ensure that their work is to foster understanding while they discharge their function of educators. Some might say this, the UDHR isn't a signed document. Some might say we weren't around that time, and I hear people say that. 58 states got together and did this. But the Child Rights Convention, ratified by all states bar one, that's the United States. Of course, in the US, we don't worry too much about protections. Well, there is strong legal safeguards. Yeah, it's the footnote there. But nevertheless, 
for the rest of the rest of the states of the world, they have an obligation to ensure they respect the Child Rights Convention. And what does it say in Article 29? It says that, of course, states agree to educate their children. That there is a duty on, the, on, their, on their part to uh, provide education. But that it should be directed at development of respect for human rights. So education comes the duty to, to make sure it is directed promoting human rights. Respect for civilizations different from his or her own, so children should be exposed to that. And preparing the child for adult life in a free society in spirit of understanding, peace, tolerance, equality of sexes, and friendship amongst all peoples of ethnic, national, and religious uh, variations and of indigenous origin. So again, the international law is very clear upon educators. They have an obligation to ensure that education is used to promote tolerance and friendship amongst all groups. Perhaps UNESCO, uh, I spent today with a UNESCO idea and, uh, and, and, and the WHO sponsored a meeting on education and anti-Semitism. In 1995, UNESCO passed a set of principles on, the, on promoting tolerance. And the link is very clear in this declaration from 1995. Article 4 of the declaration speaks about different elements of this. It in fact declares, and of course the whole world agreed with this, education is the most effective means of preventing intolerance. The first step in this education is to teach people what their shared rights and freedoms are. So they know what their rights are and they respect these rights for others as well. And the declaration says also it is an in, in urgent imperative and it is necessary to, to have a systematic and rational teaching methods to do this. So it doesn't, ha doesn't happen out of haphazard means of teaching. There must be specific methodology devised to ensure that they teach uh, tolerance and respect for uh, diversity in the classroom. And also it must be geared at countering influences that lead to fear and exclusion of others. Fear is often behind intolerance. Ignorance is behind fear. So education can, again, contribute to dissolving these, these barriers that people have. And of course, it also guides states to what, what to do. So it talk, talks about improving teacher training. So real investments have to be made. The curricula are, are, are important, as well as content of textbooks and lessons and other materials used, as well as technologies used for education. So very clear guidance to states on what they must do and how they might go about uh, 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 doing this. However, this link isn't always recognized. I have been in many countries where parents and certainly teachers in many contexts are so focused on getting grades. They want their cohort to end up in universities and that's what they want, want most to do. I've come to countries where parents are focused on the STEM branch of studies, ignoring social sciences, history and context and all of that. So in that context, education is an instrument to achieve an income, not designed uh, to create the understanding that one requires to live a fulfilling life in a diverse uh, a, a community. And of course, in a globalized world, we can no longer live in our parochial corners with our prejudices. Maybe there was a time 30, 40, 50 years ago we could have done that, but today we have global connections and communications and every prejudice that we may have harbored somewhere quietly now becomes center stage, it can be harmful, it can kill. So therefore, there's an urgent need again to ensure that we do this. Now, religion, of course, is frequently implicated in fostering intolerance. Most religions argue that's the only way to go. And of course, many are quite adamant in showing that others are on a wrong path and possibly do so in, in very, very fearsome language. And of course, many claim, oh, we have a duty to make sure that we raise our young in this faith. So schools are geared to teaching a particular religion a particular way. And this, of course, is a problem globally. But of course, there are also, again, ways we can address this. I'll come to that, that in a minute. But first is to look at the ways in which we are failing to make the connection between education and promoting tolerance. I know of countries, as, as you all know, where certain communities based on their race or maybe on religion are denied access to education. 
And in some schools, if they know what your faith is, out you go. Or they may use that knowledge to harass you as, as a child uh, in, in, in school. So this is, those bad policies must, must end uh, Im immediately. And then next is about addressing how we teach religion. Well, if, if, if something is funded by the state, it must not discriminate against any, anybody. It must teach equality. And of course, we have from ODA guidance called the Toledo Principles on Teaching Religion in Public Schools. The idea is that every child should have an understanding of what all different faiths are, of, of different ways of being are. Well, of course, they may pick up their, their, their ways of practicing uh, their religion, but they must know what other religions are in a historical and neutral fashion. Now, it will be surprised how often states fail in this task of providing education on religion in a neutral uh, uh, and historical uh, fashion. And then, of course, we can also draw heart from, uh, from the positive stories of how religion has been, how education has been influential, education and awareness. In the early 80s, the AIDS epidemic was seen as a curse upon a certain lifestyle. And now what took people to break that vicious understanding? It was what is called cognitive liberation. The understanding that, hey, no, it doesn't work like that. The poor are affected by this more than other people. It's not a lifestyle, it's not a lifestyle issue, it's an access to health service issue maybe. And that recognition then made people, people pursue a, a combative action to address the issue. And I think the, the examples of where faith-based groups have since joined in this campaign is, 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 quite, is uh, quite important. Education can be preventive. Uh, we don't have to wait until somebody grows up to become a bigot, a, a hate monger, and, and goes out and spills blood. By teaching education, by teaching human rights, by fostering tolerance, we are preventing the easy exploitation of young minds by others. We are building resilience to our young minds to ensure they, they remain inoculated against hatred as they grow up. And of course, education is transformative. That's what makes societies different, those based on supposition perhaps, and those who are based on, on more, 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 if you like, rational, rational thought. When we say tolerance, we don't mean, we don't mean that we are trying to, it's not like a bitter medicine you take and you tolerate that. We're talking about not a concession, not an indulgence. We are talking about something more positive. At least in the UNESCO context, they define uh, tolerance as the acceptance of different ways of being. To recognize that there are different ways of being and that they're equally valid and that we recognize they have a right to be who they are. And this comes through communication, contact, and education. Two points I before I conclude. I've just rattled out a whole set of international standards that are there um, upon states to, to promote uh, human rights and tolerance to education. How do we make sure states actually pursue this? We often talk to the foreign ministries and diplomats are pretty expert at you know, um, obfuscating issues and giving long-winded replies. We often talk to justice ministries, okay, they'll tell the law, but we need to speak to the op operational people, people who actually do education in this context. So the operational approach to human rights is to talk to and target those policymakers actually involved in the discharge of that particular function. And when we, when we speak with them, we need to look at the efforts that they're making. Is there a budget for, for teaching tolerance in schools? Is there a budget to teaching combating anti-Semitism in cl classrooms? Is there a budget for teaching gender equality in classrooms? Then are there curricula that, that, that is relevant for this purpose and, and fit for purpose? And is there an evaluation of what happens? So we need to do that. I want to end by something I learned from, something I learned from Albert Hirschman. The importance of, or the value of, using asymmetric attention to our advantage. We have big nations, we have big industry, big, big things. Doing, doing all sorts of things that they, they do best. But as individuals who are often victims of hatred, we are in a weaker position. How do we then come out of this, this disadvantage? What I learned from Mr. Mr. Hirschman was that asymmetric attention can work to our advantage. That by focusing on an issue, by, by remaining focused on an issue, we can actually overcome great disadvantage. So I call upon all of us 
to recognize the importance of using education to advance respect for human rights, promote tolerance and understanding, and keep working at it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Winter, the floor is yours. Thank you, Davide. What Shahid said before, after this first speaker, wow, well, what should I say? Now what did I say after these two speakers, wow. Ladies and gentlemen, let me first of all express also my satisfaction of the number of participants at this two days workshop, and in particular at this panel. As Vice President of the World Jewish Congress, I'm proud to say that after Warsaw and Paris, this is already the third time that the World Jewish Congress is partnering with UNESCO in organizing and running this workshop. Since its creation in Geneva in 1936, the WWJC has prioritized universal respect of human rights, religious coexistence, education, interfaith dialogue, and the fight against racism. Its experts were important stakeholders in drafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the two international covenants, and other human rights treaties. Through the advocacy efforts of WJC delegates, amendments were also made possible to Article 26 of the Universal Declaration on the Right to Education, not only calling for education that strengthens respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms, but also education promoting understanding, tolerance, and friendship among all nations, racial, or religious groups. Thus, an education that is promoting tolerance is really part of the World Jewish Congress's DNA. As anti-Semitism as anti has reemerged, showing its ugly face with an alarming rate in many countries in Europe, in the US, and in many other countries, education that promotes tolerance is a key element to combat and to safeguard our societies, democracy, and the rule of law. This, as you all know, is a difficult, long-term approach that will not produce immediate results, but requires commitment, insistence, and hard work. But this is one of the few ways at our disposal that gives us hope that citizens are free, that are free from racism and intolerance, living in brotherhood with their neighbors. By the way, I personally do not like the word tolerance very much in this context. And I think you raised it before also somehow. It suggests, in my view, a relationship where one, person's, where one person concedes to the other person to live the way he or she wants to. In the history of the Jews, we had often situations where emperors issued so-called tolerance edicts, conceding the Jews to live in their region, obviously with all kinds of restrictions and against the payment of hefty taxes and other dues. This exactly demonstrates, in my view, the problematic connotation of the word tolerance in this context. I propose that we should rather talk of respect, mutual respect. This term unambiguously suggests that we, human beings, are all equal, with same rights, on equal footing, eye to eye. Still, for the purpose of this discussion, I certainly do not mind to continue to use the word tolerance. As we all know, and now I come to anti-Semitism in more detail, anti-Semitism has many facets, which makes the issue rather complex and difficult to grasp. In that respect, having a universally recognized definition, such as the working definition of the International, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, IRA, becomes a very practical tool to help educators define and address the problem. Apart from, of course, and in addition to the family, education to tolerance and respect must start very young. In school, as a matter of fact, preferably even in preschool groups. From experience in many countries, we know that teachers often lack the tools and are not sufficiently trained to deal with the subtleties of the issues with Holocaust denial or trivialization, conspiracy theories, with other genocides or with current Israeli policies. 
They need to be equipped with answers for rather difficult questions. Curricula need to be directed towards cultivating tolerance and critical thinking in the minds of the pupils and students so that they are vaccinated against ills such as extremism, racism, and conspiracy theories. In order to successfully, hopefully successfully, fight anti-Semitism, it is important to include in the curricula teaching pupils and students of the non-Jewish society about our religion, about our values, about our history, about our culture, and about our way of life. We are so few in many countries that the non-Jewish population has often very little contact with us, sometimes none at all, so that they have little or no chance to meet us and to get to know us. But for effective mutual tolerance, this obviously also goes the other way around. Also, we Jews should learn and know more about the religions, the cultures, and values of our non-Jewish environment. Clearly, dialogue is the key for mutual understanding. The more we dialogue with each other, the more we get to know each other and understand each other, and the more we hopefully respect each other. But let me now make perhaps a few comments on the situation in Switzerland. I'm here not only as the Vice President of the Virtuous Congress, but also as the President of the umbrella organization of most of the Jewish communities in Switzerland. So let's focus perhaps on the situation in Switzerland. Antisemitism has always been and unfortunately continues to be, as in so many other countries, a very negative factor here as well. We see antisemitism in many parts of society, in extreme right-wing circles, on the radical left, amongst Muslims, and also amongst radical animal protection activists. And also in what I would call in the middle of society, a long-standing, perhaps even sometimes humoristic form of, uh, of anti-Semitism. However, I'm glad to say that the situation in Switzerland is less dramatic than in other countries around us. Physical attacks, as they happen so often in Germany, France, and other countries, are fortunately rare. In the offline world, the number of anti-Semitic incidents over the last few years, as either reported to us or to other organizations or in the media, this number has remained pretty stable over the last few years. But we believe, however, that the number of cases non-reported is probably very high. But as in other countries, we also observe in Switzerland an alarming increase of anti-Semitic incidences in internet and in particular in the social media. The numbers are indeed staggering. The numbers we have also noted with great concern that while in the past people posting such anti-Semitic content remained anonymous, today very often, they have no problem whatsoever disclosing openly their identity. For many, anti-Semitism has obviously become socially acceptable. When it comes to educating tolerance in Switzerland, I must mention that due to the Swiss federal system, of our educational system does not lie within the competence of the Swiss Confederation, of the Swiss government, but within the competence of the cantons in the U.S., you'd say, in the, in, the, in the States, or in Germany, or Lender. As a result, also educating tolerance in schools varies from one canton to the other, sometimes even from one school to the other. Teachers are pretty independent on what they want to teach on this subject at all. They have the means, but very often they say, well, we have no time, and there are other subjects that we discussed before also. So they have these schedules, how they can teach and educate on Judaism, on Holocaust, educating tolerance, our subject here, but really, very often, the teachers do not really use the time and use their means to do this. Still, the Swiss government itself has also been running a project for the provision of skills, allowing young people to deal critically with the internet and with social media, recognizing hate speech, fake news, conspiracy theories, etc. 
Still, the Swiss government realizes today, and I just met the interior minister a few days ago, this is not enough. They haven't done enough. They must do more, and we are hopeful that in Switzerland, ever, you, may have, you may have heard the joke that, that uh, Albert Einstein said, once I die, I want to live in Switzerland, because in Switzerland, everything happens 20 years later. <laughs> so um, I'm not sure how quickly the Swiss government will move. But this is also true probably for the level of anti-Semitism in Switzerland. As I said before, it's on a, what shall I say, nothing is acceptable. I say it's, nevertheless, it is on an acceptable level, certainly in terms of, of anything that happens dr dramatically. Here also, I hope that um, Albert Einstein was not right, that in 20 years we'll have the same situation as in other countries. As to the activities of our federation, the Swiss Federation of Jewish Communities, which is the umbrella, as I said, of the Jewish communities, I proudly mention that a very successful dialogue project for youngsters run by our organization. This project, called Likrat, brings together young, young, uh, Jewish youngsters with non-Jewish youngsters, where our boys and girls present themselves in school classes and answer all and any questions that their counterparts raise with regard to any subject they wish to raise, be it Jewish religion, rituals, Jewish life, anti-Semitism, Israel, etc. These open and frank encounters show the pupils who often may have never met a Jew before, that Jews are not different from them, have the same desires, same dreams, same visions, etc. The feedback from the teachers is really excellent. And so far, we have been able to reach with Likrat more than 20,000 uh, pupils in school classes. And we go on and go on and go on. By the way, this project has gotten so much international publicity and recognition that many other Jewish national umbrella organizations have adopted it. So in many other countries, you'll find also Likrat projects going on. Another project that we pursue are guided visits of school teachers to uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau. Again, the feedback of the participants is very good. The same project, by the way, for teachers in the French-speaking part of Switzerland is run by CICAD, the Geneva-based Centre Intercommunautaire contre l'antisémitisme et la diffamation. In, ad in addition, CICAD also brings regularly Holocaust survivors into school classes and recently even descendants of Nazi culprits who have broken with the history of their parents or grandparents. Let me first close now this introductory statement by emphasizing that WJC works closely with UNESCO to combat anti-Semitism through education and to also promote the memory and knowledge of the Holocaust. We believe that this partnership is indispensable to form the new citizens with a strong democratic identity in a liberal society. We are honored to have been partners and support this series of workshops for education policy makers from around the world. Thank you. It is really beyond me, uh, uh, and I cannot uh, summarize all the things that have been said, and that's, I don't think that this is my role either. Uh, I'm here uh, to be who I am, an educator, and I'm here to uh, be a dissident, and I take uh, up uh, your word. I'm here to exercise my critical thinking, and I have a few, uh, um, a few things to say, and I would like uh, each of you to react uh, briefly. I have um, one certainty. Uh, we were born babies, not bigot. Uh, but I have a lot of doubts. Were, we were not born to hate. Is it uh, really correct? Kate spoke of ancient instincts. Are they so ancient? I'm frightened because very often I feel that these instincts are really not very far away from us, even in very civilized Geneva. I have an awful lot of doubts on never again. Frankly speaking, I do not believe in never again. I have students that were born after 1994 
and they know very little or nothing about Rwanda. They never heard about Cambodia, and they have very few notions about the Shoah, not to mention the genocide of the Armenians or other slaughtering and massacres. This is very scary to me as an educator. And I'm not talking about high school uh, pupils. I'm talking about undergrad students. I'm talking about graduate students. So the situation for me as an educator uh, is uh, serious. I was thinking about uh, um, democracy and human rights. I do see a serious problem of both of them, both of them being trivialized and taken for granted. And they are just like plants that have not been watered for quite some time. They dry up. And as educators, I do believe we should do more to cherish them. Because this is the only way we can do the kind of uh, things that both the three of you actually said in your, in your talk. Uh, I was thinking when, um, Ahmed, you referred to uh, uh, countries that uh, do not teach humanities, social sciences, and focus only on some disciplines. You know, uh, it came to my mind education in the American South at the turn of the century, and the Hamptons and Tuskegee, where Amerindians and Afro-Americans were prevented from studying arts, Greek, Latin, because they were not good enough to do that. And so education was, in the end, a matter of segregation and led to Jim Crow's. So I do believe that we do have a duty to cherish this kind of education, and I'm not so sure that we do enough. And um, Dr. Winter, you said uh, you started with, um, I don't know if this is a lapsus or a very revealing sentence. You said anti-Semitism re-emerged which means that it has never disappeared completely. It, a lapsus. it was not a lapsus. I'm afraid that this was not at all a lapsus, and we could extend this to racism. Yeah. Racism has re-emerged because uh, it has never been defeated. Unfortunately, it is with us. And lately, it seems to me that it has re-emerged in very apparent, tan tangible ways. I, like you, uh, prefer respect to tolerance, but I, do, I, I think I do believe the way in which you reframe and redefine tolerance, and this is also something that uh, we can discuss. And I would end up by picking up on another point that you mentioned at the very end of your speech, the presence in the very middle of society, of a civilized Swiss society, of anti-Semitism. And this is also something that is quite scary because it is via jokes, uh, making comments, etc. that precisely so many things like racism and anti-Semitism or Islamophobia can re-emerge. And um, because of a diffuse ignorance and because we refuse to be dissident and to take seriously criti critical thinking, we open the door to negationists, to conspira conspiracy theories, and all the other points that you made in your remarkable speech. So I will stop here. Um, it, my reaction was just a reaction à chaud, as we would say in French. I, I thought out loud and I reacted to the wonderful speeches and I invite the three of you to comment before we open the floor to our uh, audience, yes. Kate, would you like to? Uh, no, I'm fine. You okay? Okay. Yeah. So we can go straight to straight to that. Hello, my name is Joël Fiss. I am uh, part of the human rights community. 
um, I'm also part of the Jewish community, and uh, and I'm a member of the Geneva Parliament. Uh, it's a, it's it's. I just wanted to ask a question in regards to the relationship between the Jewish community and the United Nations. So um, I did have the privilege to uh, to collaborate with Dr. Shahid, and I would like to salute his uh, fantastic report on anti-Semitism, um, which uh, which for me is really a historical report, and it even has the potential to reset the relations uh, between the Jewish community and the United Nations to a certain degree, because uh, the relationship is is. Uh, is, is, a, is a very strange one. Uh, as, as much as Jewish communities around the world are very much committed to the rules-based and multilateral system and very active, uh, uh, they are quite disengaged uh, at the United Nations for a number of reasons. And, um, and uh, um, you know, your predecessor, Heiner Bielfeld, with whom I collaborated as well, uh, once told me, Joel, I don't understand. Uh, I never receive complaints from the Jewish communities. The, Jew the Jewish communities never, you know, uh, ask me for help or table complaints or, or remain active. And so clearly, you know, there are reasons for that. Perhaps the, the Durban Conference Against Racism in, in 2001, perhaps item seven on the Human Rights Council agenda, all sorts of things. But my question is really to Dr. Shahid, but also to, to Madame Gilmore. Um, there is a trust deficit between uh, worldwide Jewish communities in the United Nations. This is a historical moment where Dr. Shahid has published a, a hugely important report. How can we use this momentum to rebuild uh, bridges between uh, the UN and Jewish communities and, and, and to, to bridge this gap? Thank you. Shall we collect a couple of questions? Um, I'm a little concerned about the fact that we are addressing, we seem to be addressing the issue a bit in the abstract and are avoiding the elephant in the room or in this particular instance, the hyenas in the room because whether it's anti-Semitism or it's Islamophobia or it's any other form of racism or bigotry, the issue is not so much, I think, dealing with the, say, students, the population that is not aware of it, but it is really dealing with the elements that are perpetrating these um, manifestations of intolerance and worse. And my question is how, what can we, uh, or let me step back, the president of the World Jewish Congress in dealing with anti-Semitism has embarked on action, not words, as a way of dealing with it. Uh, in some instances, for example, in Bulgaria, a, an annual march to, uh, to, com to commemorate a Nazi collaborator has been countered quite effectively by a march of tolerance which brought in civil society, but effectively to counter the dark elements. And my question is, how do we integrate that element in not just educating, but also really to counter those who are promoting the dark elements? Thank you. Okay, I can start by answering these two questions. Okay, thank you. Um, it's good to see you, Joel, um, and thank you for asking that question. Uh, I think it's very important that the Jewish communities around the world feel that the UN also works for them. Uh, right now, of course, the UN is a, is a multi-pronged body. UNESCO is doing good work here. Um, but there are other parts of the UN which are quite toxic and, and, and um, are quite destructive uh, to Jewish interests. And item seven is one. So I think um, the, it is up to the UN now to take this moment to look at what it can do to reach out to Jewish communities and re-engage with them. In my report to the UN, I did identify some elements of 
how this can be done. I hope that there's a follow-up on this. And this morning we heard there are some follow-up to that happening as we speak. And uh, we spoke early later this after, uh, later, uh, early today about um, the need to make UN staff more aware of different forms of anti-Semitism and, and, and become more, more self-aware of how they, they could be unconsciously perhaps, sometimes consciously of course, um, you know, wading into anti-Semitism. So there is the, the need to work on that. So building bridges with the UN and the Jewish communities, I think is an important thing. I refer to Albert Hirschman at my end because I want to say that I will remain focused on my report. I'm not, I'm not going to move to the next report. I will remain focused on this report and see maybe two years or one year later, how far we have moved with implementing that. So that is um, one, one way of doing that. In terms of how do we, how do we you know, speak to the elephant in the room? Um, Madam Gilmer and I, we were in some place called the Istanbul Process Meeting in The Hague a couple of weeks back. The idea is to bring together people who are doing actual work to address these issues. And while we were in The Hague, we discovered many initiatives, many of them local uh, to the Netherlands, uh, but we also heard from others who are doing work elsewhere in actually practically countering hate, mo hate, hate mongers. So we came across an initiative uh, between a rabbi and a Muslim uh, uh, person in, in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, it's called Mu and Mos, I think. Uh, trying to uh, jointly visit in schools and showing how, how different communities work together. So I think it's important to mobilize those who are doing good work, mobilize, uh, get critical mass, and then keep pushing back. I think that's one way of doing that. And also uh, look at how technologies can be used for good effect. Right now we've been swamped by, uh, uh, by bad use of technology in terms of social media abuses, but I think we should also use the, the positive potential of that to, to push back. I'm sorry, I don't have a clear answer, but I think we need to really fo focus on looking, uh, uh, mobilizing the good and making sure those, those who are doing good work are pulled together to make an impact. If I could just add to what you said here at the end, I think there is good in this society. And I think it's important that these good elements in society really come together from whatever angles of society they are and find their common goal. I don't think it's, it's important and it would be useful to fight the demonstration as the one as you described before. But I think long term, I think it's much more important that really these, the various groups and the various people in the society come together and f find their common value, values on which they want to form society. Kate, do you want to add? Oh, I, you know, just to appreciate both comments, uh, the UN is uh, multifaceted. It has its very political parliament, <laughs> uh, including uh, uh, necessarily uh, the politics of the Human Rights Council. Um, I trust that you know, with the Special Rapporteur's breakthrough report, more concentrated, visible momentum to uh, bring the UN clearly behind countering anti-Semitism can be found. Um, and the second thing, you know, I was just checking, it says on the title of the uh, event that it's about education. If it had been promoting human rights, tolerance and non-discrimination, the role of counter impunity, we would have talked about something else. <laughs> if it had been the role of political leadership, we would have given another emphasis. I think it's very important that we stress that this is an at the window we're gazing upon this hatred um, is the window of education. But education is but one pillar. And I think there is a uh, an interesting question as to whose ignorance is most toxic. I'm not sure it's the youngs. And uh, a, a, a real challenge to us would have been to say, uh, how do we return the young young to the fundamentals, to a sort of a 101 course uh, of a kind that could decontaminate or at least vaccinate against this ridiculous... I mean, it's the most stupid idea human beings have ever come up, managed to come up with, that uh, somehow who you are, how you look, what you worship, is a, a basis for stratification. I mean, we've done some dumb things in our lives as human beings, but that's about, that's right up there. 
Okay, we've got two questions here. Yes, um, thank you for the speakers uh, speaking and insisting on uh, teaching um, tolerance and respect in school because young people become adults and they have responsibility of adults and it's necessary for, uh, for pupils just to hear about respect and tolerance. Uh, as an adult, I have been taught uh, nonviolent communication by Marshall Rosenberg, who is a Jewish man, uh, an American one, and uh, I, I just realized that his method is very important because he teaches us empathy. Empathy is a way to be in the shoes of the neighbor or of the, of the opponent. So it's a way, it's a tool for respect and tolerance. And this teaching of Marshall Rosenberg is, gives the opportunity to communicate between people, even if they are opponents. And I think it's, it's a real way to promote respect and tolerance. And uh, now there are some, some uh, teachers in Africa, especially Cote d'Ivoire and other and Israel and other countries are, who teach this nonviolent communication. And we can have hope that these pupils that have been taught this tool will, as adults, take responsibility, even in government. Why not? So as to bring peace. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with, uh, I am Yitzhak Dayan, the chief rabbi of the Jewish community of Geneva. Just with your permission, two remarks. I would like, to, uh, first of all, to thank the speakers. And I remark that the, fo the focus on education, the high importance, but always based on human rights. Why not to speak about human duties? Human duties, because when we are educating people to human rights, we understand what they have to receive from the society. In other words, what the society will give to them. But if you educate people on human duties, what they have to give to the society. In other words, duty implies rights and not the contrary. The second remark, please, uh, the term tolerance disturbs me a lot because I don't want to be, to be tolerated. I am what I am. So I would like to be accepted as I am. To tell you the truth, I don't find a better word, neither in, in English or in French, for this term tolerance. But for me, there is a connotation of superiority. We have a third question up there. Yes, you've got the mic. Yeah, please go ahead. Is it on? Oh, sure. um, hi there. My name is Hillary Miller. I work for United Nations Watch, and uh, previously I worked for the Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law, which submitted uh, findings to Dr. Shahid's report. So thank you so much for being receptive to those findings and including them. My question relates to how educators are supposed to interpret anti-Semitism in teaching curriculum on tolerance and on teaching against bias and hatred. So um, in my experience as an undergraduate, there were courses you know, specifically on Islamophobia or specifically on combating anti or the phenomenon of anti-Semitism. And I am curious your, uh, your insights and your intake as to whether these forms of hatred, bias, and intolerance are supposed to be taught as isolated phenomenon as they are so unique and they are so nuanced and complex in themselves, or are they supposed to be taught as this omnibus issue collectively that you know, tolerance and bias against certain groups exists in this general category? Thank you. Who would like to start? Thank you very much. Three big questions. Um, all right. 
I fully endorse this idea of empathy-based training. In fact, that links to the last question as well, how do we do this? I think empathy-based um, education with regard to non-discrimination, intolerance, and hatred is the way to go, because then it, it, it empowers them to learn, not just look at people as victims, but look at people as in, in a positive light as well. Um, we often talk about genocides and other massacres and so on as victims and perpetrators. But no, we talk about human beings. And then to recognize that there is a much larger, I mean, if you look at, if you look at say, Holocaust education, um, I've seen in some contexts the focus being on um, Jews as victims. And then and missing the entire story of Jews as human beings and the contribution of civilization and so on and so forth. Empathy-based best learning would be focusing on how they will put themselves in, in their situation and learn the full totality of experience of being a Jew. So I think that is a very, very, very important thing to have it based on, based on empathy. On duties, that's a very good point, but, but I think the context to why we call rights and not duties. Of course, if you look at the UDHR, duties are clearly there. Of course, but it, is, it makes clear that there are duties upon state and upon individuals how to treat other people. So it is very clear there are duties. But, but the way, reason why perhaps I'm reluctant to emphasize duties is because until the UDHR, and of course still in countries where they don't recognize the human rights framework, they would say, we recognize duties. So you as an individual owe a duty to all of us. And therefore, I have no rights because my duties come ahead. And unless I perform a duty, and this could be obeisance to the, to the leader, until I perform my duty, I don't have a right. And we talk about freestanding human rights, regardless of whether or not you have performed, performed, performed that duty. And that is a major element about the human rights framework. But, but I do get your point. I think we've taken the rights argument too far ahead without recognizing the duties that we also have as, as human beings toward, towards other. So, you know, Article 1 of UDHR, all people are born equal rights and dignity, uh, are endowed with reason and conscience, and must, must treat others in the spirit of brotherhood. That's a duty there right, itself. So the idea of duty corresponding obligations towards others is, I think, well embedded. We need to make sure when we teach that, we actually do, uh, do that. Um, tolerance is, is a bad choice of word. My preferred word is inclusion. But I'm told I'm, I'm too left-wing for saying that. But for me, inclusion is actually what we want. We don't want communities in different corners doing their bit. I want them all to be part of the state, part of society. They're included. That requires respect, requires participation, requires equality, dignity, and so on and so forth. So for me, the preferred word is inclusion. I would love to have it, uh, but I'm still against fighting against odds to, 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 have, to have that done. Um, the question about education, you know, what's the best way to do it? I think there are two elements to this. Each form of hatred has a uniqueness to, uh, to, to that. That must be captured by looking at that in that context. If we just spoke, in, spoke about intolerance in general, we would miss the unique ways in which anti-Semitism manifests itself. We have to focus on that uniqueness as well. But we say take a human rights-based approach, which means we talk about focus on human dignity, of equal dignity of everybody. So to recognize that, it's just as bad to be anti-Semitic as it is to be something else in terms of a, a, a big bigotry. But I think we cannot move away from familiarizing with the specifics of each form of uh, intolerance, but, but make sure we are talking about everybody being included in our opposition to intolerance. But that is neither here nor there in terms of question, but I think it is, it is part of both. I'm also in favor of not selecting out things too much. A holistic approach is important. Whether it is a right, a human right, don't take one right, that's where we get into problem with duties. Look at the entire framework, because you cannot enjoy one right in isolation, especially when you could be violating other, others' rights as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Just, just on this rights and duties piece, uh, in fact, um, I, I find a useful way to think about it is to imagine, imagine an, uh, um, an axis, a horizontal and a vertical. The horizontal is what we have been affirming, which is an equality of rights between us all as a foundation principle. Duties is more, for me, a vertical access. Your duties increase, as does your power. And when you treat them as the same, you completely miss the power relationship. I'm sorry, a state has duties. 
completely fundamentally different from the baby born in equality and in rights. And the minute, and an, interestingly, it's been the state that has tried to transfer duties to the individual and suppress rights through saying you have a duty to state order, to respect the king, to respect the government. You have a duty to comply with the legal laws. Be very, very careful to blend, do anything that fuses duty and rights. Be very clear that duties are about power. The duty of the parent to the child, the duty of the doctor to the patient, the duty of the teacher to the student, the duty of the member of parliament to the constituency, the duty of the head of the state through the rule of law to the rights of the citizens. That is the fundamental difference between human rights and humanitarian response, actually. That being said, what I did try to say, and, and clearly did not say it very clearly, well, no wonder, because I'm not being clear. Oh, anyway, moving on. Uh, is that I cannot exercise my rights in a way that infringes your rights. And that is a very precious concept. But the duty for adjudicating my rights versus your rights is not a personal and individual duty. And that's where the rule of law, the independence of the judiciary, the normative, meaning we have definitions of terms, have to come into play. I cannot self-nominate my rights. This is very precious to the idea of community. So I think now, 70 years into the modern human rights framework, these things do matter a lot. Meaning of language matters in order that we continue, I think, to move to a point where we can accelerate implementation. And implementation is clearly the real problem. It's lacking and needed. Sorry. A final word? Yeah, on the same point of rights versus duties that you raised. The way I see it is that, as you said before a moment ago, the rights are go so far as you are not allowed to infringe the rights of others. And I think that itself is a duty. You must stop, and that's, a du in my view, a duty. You must stop where you infringe the rights of others. So the, the, the very fact that we talk about human rights which have, a, which have a border, actually includes the fact that you have uh, human duties as well. So I think that, that's my understanding to that on the point of empathy that you raised. First of all, I think whoever, I, I forgot the name of this gentleman. Uh, no, no, the, the one who made- Marshall Rosenberg. Marshall Rosenberg, okay, Marshall Rosenberg. Who reads Marshall Rosenberg? Not that many people in the... Okay, very good, fantastic. Okay, I haven't read him. But, okay, no jokes. I think it's important, empathy is important, as we all agree, I guess. And that's certainly the key for good human contacts and living together. But I think the, the empathy comes with knowing each other. And I raised this in my, in my talk. I think uh, we don't have to talk about empathy. You have to meet... We have to meet each other. We have to understand each other. Obviously, there are always people then who say, well, I don't like this guy or I don't like this person anymore. But with knowing more about the other person, you develop the empathy. I don't think that we need the theory of Marshall XYZ. I forgot his name. Uh, I think the fact that if we really educate our youngsters and bring the youngsters, I'm talking again, the young generation together, uh, of all kinds of groups, be it religious groups or other social groups, and learn about each other and talk to each other, I think that creates, in most cases, a certain level of uh, empathy. Now, what I wanted to also address is the question of how, how you teach tolerance. Uh, I don't want to address it in a general sense, but I'm talking about anti-Semitism. I think anti-Semitism is often based, or probably always based nowadays, on prejudices. And I think if in schools 
you can show that these prejudices are what they are, prejudices, and that your Jewish neighbor, uh, kid in the school or whoever, is not the, 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 the son of the rich Jew or uh, the, the, the daughter of a, a crooked Jew, as all these uh, prejudices say, but a normal person, I think that, that helps to, uh, to uh, fight, uh, combat these prejudices. And by fighting prejudices, I think that for me is probably the key element in combating anti-Semitism. I'm not talking about other forms of racism, but certainly as far as uh, the, um, the dislike of, of Jews is concerned, I think it very much depends on, it has to do, not depends, it has to do with all these prejudices like Jews murdered Jesus Christ, et cetera, et cetera. I think if we can find ways to uh, pass on these messages, I think a good part of people who hear that these are really just prejudices will find, will come to a different conclusion later on. Let me conclude our gathering simply by, first of all, thanking you all for coming so late on a Monday night in mid-December. Uh, and, uh, and more importantly, to thank our wonderful panelists for all the inputs and reflections. And I learned a great deal from all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you again. And there will be a reception upstairs.